All right, well, let's get started. So welcome everybody. Uh, this session is called Earth Repair Here and Abroad with Judith Schwartz. Uh, we're looking forward very much to hearing from Judith real quick. I just wanna say I'm Chadley Cole with Nofu New Hampshire and I'll be moderating with my staff members, Nikki and Laura. And once again, we're asking everyone, keep yourselves muted during the uh, workshop, put questions in the chat box and we will read them aloud towards the end of the session for the Q&A. Please note we are recording this session and all workshop, workshop sessions, which will be available to you after the conference. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Judith Schwartz. Hi everyone, and thank you everyone for sticking around through the end of the day. So I know it can be a long day. And just to introduce myself, I'm a journalist. I live over in Vermont, actually in the Southwest corner of the state. So I'm, I'm only just a couple of miles from New York state. And so um, as a journalist, um, always, asking questions and the questions I was asking about the challenges that we face led me to write about soil. So I wrote a book about soil called Cows Save the Planet. And then some other, I felt the story, anyway, that led me to write a book about water called Water in Plain Sight. And that journey led me to write a book about global ecosystem restoration and the growing global restoration movement called the Reindeer Chronicles. And that is what I will focus on here. And I will just launch into that discussion. So a few years ago, I started collecting stories about earth repair. The news about the environment was relentlessly upsetting and yet I knew that there were people out there doing incredible things. Farmers, ranchers, gardeners, permaculturists, and others, all embracing a sim similar mindset, working with nature rather than fighting her. The assumption we tend to have is that landscapes are static, that they stay the same unless, of course, something bad happens to them, and they get worse. You know, you look at the condition of a given area of land and think that it's always been that way. But we know that ecosystems are by nature dynamic, that the balance of various processes and species are continually shifting. And from my reporting, I knew that even the most degraded landscapes could be revived. So on that note, let's do a little bit of traveling, which requires this little technological trick. Where'd it go? Wait a second. Um, okay. Um, you know, we worked this out just beforehand share screen, just that I'm not seeing, there it is. Okay. All right, so our travel is taking us to Western Saudi Arabia. Neil Spackman was a college student when 9-11 happened and having befriended a Muslim goldsmith while doing missionary work in Guatemala after high school, wanted to understand Islamic culture and the politics of the Middle East. So he became a student of Arabic. When the Al Beda project, an effort to improve living conditions for impoverished Bedouin in Saudi Arabia got underway, Neil's language ability got him hired. Here in a valley between the cities of Mecca and Jeddah, the land had deteriorated to the point where local Bedouin could no longer live as they had for thousands of years, moving with their herds of animals and sleeping in goat haired tents. Instead, they had been settled in cinder block houses with no viable livelihoods. Urbanization also meant the loss of their traditional diet 
of fresh dairy and grains and more sweet and processed food with inevitable consequences for their health. Yeah, so the land had deteriorated so that they couldn't, there, there was nothing growing for their animals to graze. So because their animals were so important to their identity as a people, I mean, that's what their culture had revolved around, they were buying feed from Australia for their animals. In order to get the money to buy the feed, they were cutting down the trees that were left for to sell as firewood to restaurants in the cities. So again and again, um, in my we run into these situations where, where in order to participate in the global economy, people are in a situation where they feel they have no choice but to undermine the ecology upon which they depend. So that was the scenario um, in Albeda. Neil proposed an ecological component to the project and fast-tracked a course of study in permaculture. He and his team put in swales. He worked, he had a team, a small team of um, local Bedouin. Um, they put in swales and various simple earthworks to capture water in those precious rare instances when they did get rain. And after every rainfall, they rushed to plant. By holding on to the rain, they had a bank of water to draw on to keep the trees and other plants alive. And this piece is important. They worked within their water budget, making sure never to overdraw their water account. They kept up this routine, harvesting water and planting for several years, often with a year or more between rains. Then in 2016, the project ran out of funds and they had to stop the irrigation. Oh, well, Neil said resigned, thinking that the permaculture ideal is to create a self-sustaining ecological system. And so this provided a chance for them to see if they succeeded. Two years and a scant five centimeters of rain later, they found that 80% of the trees survived. In 2019, Neil went back and shared these images. Okay, so this is, this is a before and after. So this is before. So this was after a rainfall in the beginning of the project. So they started in 2010. So this was either 2011 or 2012, again, after a rain. Yeah, so it must have been a couple of years in because they had put in some, some little earthworks to slow down the rain. And you can see that that's where some of the moisture was held and you, you get some grass. Now this is in 2019. So it's quite, quite a transformation. I feel that it's important to share these stories for several reasons. One is to help us envision a positive future. For how can people imagine once damaged ecosystems flourishing unless we know that it's possible? Another is that each example of earth repair embodies valuable how-to knowledge that can be applied in other places. So what I'm seeing is a bank of, well, like the water bank, uh, like this um, body of knowledge that of how people restore their ecosystems so that people can sort of take a little bit from the Albeda project, take a little bit about what has been done in, in Mexico under holistic planned grazing. So, so, so there's a, a body of knowledge that people can draw on in a way that fits their own context. So while the type of crops you might grow in say Hawaii are quite different from what farmers would choose in New Hampshire, the basic principles of building fertile soil and holding on to water remain the same. And finally, it invites people into the process of restoring ecologies because we see that this can happen everywhere and at all scales. 
In short, while we've been trained to believe that solving societal problems is best left to experts, earth repair is a participatory sport, and no one is better poised to lead this than farmers. One story that launched me on this path, meaning that I thought everyone should know about it, is the restoration of the Los Plateau in China. This is where agriculture in China began around the same time as it did in the Fertile Crescent and was long the breadbasket of China. However, hundreds of years of poor management led to massive erosion with the mineral rich but friable soil blowing away and silting up the Yellow River. This is a pattern in agriculture that we've seen through history around the world one that has been documented by authors from Plato, yes, Plato, to George Perkins Marsh, another Vermonter, to J. Russell Smith, who wrote a really incredible book called Tree Crops, A Permanent Agriculture. The pattern is that agriculture begins in the riverbeds, um, then you start irrigation and over time irrigation depletes the soil leads to high minerality and salinity. So people move up into the hillside clearing forests and letting livestock roam at will. So that's what happened. That's what happened in the Los Plateau. In the early 1990s, Weary of dealing with continuous flooding and poverty in the region, the Chinese government embarked on a huge watershed rehabilitation project with help from the World Bank and other entities. I mean, this was huge. They consulted with hydrologists, bi biologists, geologists, chemists, hydrologists, economists. There are always a lot of economists involved. I mentioned that restoration is a participatory sport. And here, local people from literally thousands of tiny villages were hired to do the work of moving soil, creating terraces, planting trees. Admittedly, this was a top-down effort, um, unlike what would likely fly in our culture. But ultimately, the region's people reaped the benefit as some two million were lifted from poverty. People who had been living in caves now had proper homes and many dependent on food aid were able not only to grow what they need, but have extra to sell. That is like for many people for the first time had an actual income. Now here is a, an eight second hope you can see it, an eight second version of what transpired on the Los Plateau over 14 years. <clears throat> Pretty magic, huh? Okay, um, um, now let me go back to the share and make sure I can get Judith, yes, can you hear me? I didn't. I think we we still saw the slides. Um, okay, we didn't right. see the video. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to hide PowerPoint. I'm really sorry about that. And now we'll go to. Oops. Well, that isn't what I wanted to share. All right, you're just gonna have to humor me. Um, I'll probably be able to figure it out during the questions, okay? Is that all right? Okay, thank you. Um, but I will go back to the PowerPoint. I don't usually have technical problems, but apparently, all right, so now we're just gonna keep going. We know a lot about this transformation, thanks, and it is a transformation. I will make sure you all get to see it. Thanks to John D. Liu, a Chinese American filmmaker who documented the project for the World Bank and whose time lapse 
I will make sure that you are able to see. It changed his life. John's feeling was, once you know that it is possible to rehabilitate large scale damaged ecosystems, how can you not do everything in your power to make this happen? He delved into research and found that, surprise, there was a ton of ecological research about what happens when things go wrong and little on when things go right on function and restoration. Yet, as John says, and I can confirm, it's a lot more fun to address function rather than dysfunction. And yet a focus on ecological function opens up new ways to understand our environment and how to restore the earth's wounded places. Let's take, for example, the question, what is a desert? Now, we all think that we know what a desert is and that maybe there's a threshold of how much rainfall determines whether something is a desert or not a desert. But let's see how Neil Spackman defines a desert. He says that a desert is a place where it floods when it rains. And for all its aridity, it does flood in Western Saudi Arabia. And these flooding episodes can be damaging. Neil is saying that once it no longer floods when it rains, when the water soaks in and supports life, rather than running off and causing more erosion, the land will cease to be a desert. And what we're seeing is that Albeda, this is starting to be the case. So this is in Western Saudi Arabia in one of the driest places on earth. And this is from 2019. So I imagine that if you just saw this and I hadn't told you what this was, you might not have guessed that we were talking about a desert. The process of ecosystems advancing in function and complexity, what um, is, is called succession. Simple pioneer organisms create the condition conditions for higher order species to thrive. And so the whole system functions at a higher state. So you don't just start in with big canopy trees, rather you build towards them with plants that either give way or become part of the system. The heart of ecological restoration is to advance succession. In other words, to become nature's ally on the ground and help a living community move in a positive direction. In that way is more midwifery than makeover. According to John, the way to advance succession and by extension to restore an ecosystem involves three basic trends. You can drop, jot this down because this is the recipe. Increasing biodiversity, increasing soil organic matter, and increasing biomass. In other words, plant and animal life. This is a formula that we can apply anywhere, in a local park, on a farm, in someone's front or backyard. No effort is too small. I have a friend, Monica Ibichachi, who teaches permaculture to children in New York City. She works in road medians and the ring of soil around the city trees. She and the children will mulch around the trees, building organic matter, and the kids get so excited when they see the critters that find their way into the soil. The three, biodiversity, soil organic matter, and biomass support each other as an area gains function. And this essentially is what you want to do as a farmer. Whether you're growing vegetables or grains or raising animals on pasture, to build soil fertility, grow more plant matter, and support more life. 
as a quick update as to what John Liu is doing now. After filming the Los Plateau project, he struggled to find a way to scale up ecological restoration. He had a kind of um, media enterprise for a while, and then he wanted to set up training centers. You know, nothing quite took, but he was committed to making sure that the skills and the knowledge needed to harvest water, build terraces, manage livestock, choose appropriate combinations of plants would be widely available. Then at one point he became seized with the idea of camping, of locations throughout the world where people once invited would set up tents or yurts, take their shovels and machetes and set out to heal the land. And that is what he did. So in around summer of 2016, he put out a little notice on Facebook and said, this is what I want to do, who's with me? And within a few weeks, 10,000 people had signed up and you know, the, these conversations started happening. And this, this is what launched the ecosystem restoration camps movement. Two years ago, I went to the first camp, Camp Altiplano in Spain. And here is Joe Denham from England, who is in the, um, the kitchen tent setting up lunch for all of us. So um, Camp Altiplano is where they broke in the idea, learning as they went. And one very important bit of learning that, that they came to was that they would only go to places where there was already infrastructure because the people at Camp Altiplano had to spend so much of their time setting up infrastructure. So anyway, th there it was, but they've still done amazing work that I write about in, in my book. It is hard to convey the spirit there of young people learning and applying their skills, taking part in healing a landscape and cheering celebrating every bit of progress. The thing that struck me was how the people there, mostly British and Europeans in their late 20s and early 30s, felt that they were a part of the solution, the solution to many of the challenges that they worry about, you know, like what's happening to our earth. Um, at that point, there were just two camps. Now, that was the very end of 2018. Now there are 37 with more in progress and each has its own flavor. One Camp Paradise was launched in the aftermath of the Camp Fire in California, created as a disaster response camp where the focus is how to rebuild resilience after fire and again to build a body of knowledge and a community of people who have these skills. The point is that although we don't always hear about it, there are many people out there creating and developing and applying solutions. For example, there is a practice called syntropic agroforestry that can be seen as applied succession. Here, the focus is on creating the conditions for each plant to thrive, which in turn create the conditions for the next order of organisms to thrive. The idea is to create the antithesis of entropy to concentrate rather than dissipate matter and energy. It, it at once emulates and accelerates nature. This was developed by Ernst Goch, a Swiss farmer who moved to Brazil 30 years ago and transformed 300 acres that had been deforested and overgrazed to a lush, densely vegetated area, producing three times the cocoa than is typical for the area. Um, it is being applied in many parts of the world, um, particularly from what I'm seeing in Australia and Hawaii. We saw this being implemented in Maui two years ago. They put in, this is a place called HAPI, and HAPI stands for something, Hawaii Agroforestry Permaculture Initiative, something like that. 
Um, they put in a variety of early successional plants in this landscape that would be pineapple and banana. And these generate a lot of biomass, which is pruned and put down on the, on the ground floor as mulch. Um, and this sets the stage for higher order plants like coffee and cacao. They do a similar approach also on Maui at Hokunui, um, where the forester, forester, someone named Koa Hewa Hewa, he calls it polyforestry or Polynesian agroforestry and draws from indigenous Hawaiian knowledge. He is reforesting this land a quarter acre at a time. And what we see here, this was planted about 14 months before what we're seeing here. Things grow really fast in Hawaii. So uh, another point that this brings up is that these agroforestry techniques, I mean, I said that Ernst Goch developed this. I mean, he developed one particular, you know, set of tools or, and, but all of this is drawing on indigenous knowledge. As Keith Morris pointed out earlier in the day, there are people doing agroforestry in New England, relying on similar principles, even if the plants don't produce biomass as wildly as they do in the tropics. So there are a lot of variations on this and which I'm sure that NOFA New Hampshire will have resources, perhaps workshops on. Beyond the basics of enhanced biodiversity, biomass and soil organic matter, the restoration approach for a given place depends on context. On the Los Plateau, one important strategy was removing livestock with goats and sheep wandering around, essentially unmanaged plants there did not have the chance to regrow. However, as many of you know, in many instances, grazing animals are a tool for regenerating landscapes. One place where I witnessed this is at Rancho Las Damas in the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. I went there because I learned of an interesting project. Ranchers were working with bird conservation organizations to create a habitat for endangered migratory grassland birds. I was intrigued because I didn't think of bird conservationists and, and ranchers as natural allies as such groups often clash. But the people at the bird organization saw that at, at under holistic management, which creates the optimal extent and rhythm of animal impact with cattle moving as they would in nature when pursued by predators, the land was vibrant and full of birds. The land was, as someone at the American Bird Conservatory said, very birdy. Now, the initial focus of this project was biodiversity, but enhanced biomass and soil organic, organic matter was certainly part of the picture. And one thing I'll mention is that while when I, I guess I, I went to Mexico, it was 2014, and it was it was very newsworthy that ranchers and and conservationists were working together, bird conservation societies. Um, I just saw the other day that the Audubon Society is working in California with ranchers and developing a, a large program for fire management, land management for fire resilience. So um, I'm glad to see that this is really, you know, very much the trend. One thing I like about this project is how it is expanding in the region. When I visited that, oh, so this is um, my host, Alejandro Carrillo, um, who of Rancho Las Damas. When I visited, there was a vast tract of land adjacent to Las Damas Ranch that looked horrible, mostly bare ground and mesquite. I said to Alejandro, doesn't this make you crazy? Can't you convince the owner of that land to change? Now, unlike me, Alejandro has a lot of patience. 
he answered me with one of his favorite sayings that people would rather fail conventionally than succeed while doing something different. Don't worry, Alejandro said, he'll decide to change. Three years later, the owner came to Alejandro and said, I want my land to look like your land. And that's about 100,000 acres that we're talking about. That can support a lot of birds and butterflies and mule deer and pronghorn sheep. It can support a lot of life. Now let's just shift a little bit and talk about water, which of course concerns all of us who grow things. We often think that water just happens to us, that too much or not enough water is, it's just, you know, our fate. It's, it's, we're at the mercy of the rain gods. It all depends on what does or doesn't come down from the sky. However, we have tremendous agency, particularly once we understand that we can think of soil as our water infrastructure. Let's go to Zimbabwe to the Africa Center for Holistic Management in Victoria Falls. Alan Savory, who developed the holistic management framework says that what is important is not how much rain you get, but how much effective rainfall you have. By effective rainfall, he means water that soaks into the ground. You see, you can get a huge amount of rain and if most of it evaporates or runs off, you're no better off. And you may have more problems like flooding, mudslides, lots of loss of topsoil and erosion. The, rate, the way that my Zimbabwe colleague, Precious Fury puts it, there are places where no matter how much rain you get, you end up back in drought mode. To slow water and ensure that as much as possible stays in the soil, Neil Spackman began with water harvesting. Here in Zimbabwe, the focus from the start was improving the soil. Soil organic matter, which is mostly carbon, acts as a water absorbing sponge. Another key factor is soil cover, which deters both runoff and evaporation. This in Zimbabwe is the difference between having effective and non-effective rainfall. I think this is only a few years apart and I know it's the same spot. And one thing about what happened at the, at the Africa Center is that many of their, you know, when you see the improvements is that often it took place during years where in the rest of the country, they were considered in drought. So because they were able to hold the water in the ground and give plants a chance to grow, give, give microbes a chance to, to stay alive, to help the, the, you know, help the plants grow and all of these different dynamics um, that proved to be pivotal. So we saw tremendous improvement. Restoring soil is the project of managing livestock holistically, which recreates the behavior patterns of ungulates in the wild. Managed animal impact builds the soil in many ways. It stimulates grass growth, which means drawing more carbon into the soil. Hooves press down decaying plant matter to be broken down by microbes and animal waste adds moisture and fertility to the soil. Here is one result. The Dimbengombe River now flows a full kilometer further into the catchment than in living memory, and it now flows throughout the year. It also doesn't flood the way it does in nearby parkland. So when we were visiting Dimbengombe, um, Alan Savory took us um, to, to this spot and to other spots along the river. And he showed us where kind of flotsam that was carried along during floods stayed in the trees and in across the way in the parkland, you know, managed by the National Park Service, 
it was about three meters high, whereas on Dimbingombe's land, it was three feet high. So on the parkland, um, Alan pointed out that like our vehicle, the Jeep we were in would be underwater. So, so that's, that's really important. And I went to other villages in um, near the Africa Center where the stopping of floods it was a, a huge factor in their being able to hold the water in the river banks and um, stabilize the soil and it, it just improved the land overall. Now, this is what it means in human terms. While in Zimbabwe, I had the chance to visit villages and meet with people who were working with the Africa Center. Uh, and I, I, this, I still remember, um, I remember these people, I remember this visit just so vividly. Animal impact on their crop fields meant more, more soil organic matter, which meant better water infiltration. For the people in Sienyanga, way off a dirt road near the Wangi National Park, that meant being able to grow food for seven months out of the year, rather than only two and a half months of the year around the rainy season. And for these people, this meant the difference between food self-sufficiency and being dependent on international food aid. And these people were so proud of what they had accomplished. And it was, it was really wonderful to see. So in closing, more water held in the soil means more life. More life means more water held in the soil. We can manage our land to hold more water and to increase biomass, biodiversity, and soil organic matter. This is a virtuous circle since increased soil organic matter increases land's capacity to hold water. It's these kinds of beneficial cycles, uh, examples of which we can see all over the world that create abundance. Abundance, which is of course what we all want for our farms and for ecosystems in general. And I want to note that the United Nations had declare, has declared this decade, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration that will be launching um, World Environment Day on June 5th. So stay tuned, we're going to be hearing a lot more about earth repair. So that's it for now. So should I, dare I try this or should we just have some questions? I leave it to you. I think we've got time, um, Judy, if you wanna try and try again for All that right. video. I think it's worth it. All right, everyone. Okay, so I've been building up the suspense about this this um, eight seconds of of film. Um, so here I'm I'm going to actually it's going to take me a second. So you guys can look at the questions, see because I have to um, go back and get that initial link because YouTube likes to tell you, if you like that video, you'll like this video. And they weren't totally wrong, but it isn't what I wanted. So, all right, so I've got this, this video ready. Okay. Okay, that was 14 years from 1995 to 2009. And you can see that that shows us ecological succession. The last two, sec two seconds or a few seconds of the eight, you see the greening and the maturing of the, of the plants. It's pretty cool. That's very cool. Um, Nikki, do you want to take, take, ask Judy some questions? 
Yes. Um, so first, before I get into questions, we were talking about earlier that it would be wonderful if, if everyone wanted to turn on your cameras or anyone who would like to so we can see each other and um, look in gallery mode. We know that um, you know, we miss seeing you in person every year. So it's nice to see you now. Thank you. Um, just wait a second. And All right, so we have a question from A.M. Krulis who asks, do you have any specific agroforestry projects in New England you can refer us to? Okay, um, I know a little bit. So very close to me, about 15 minutes away from me, there, there's a company based in Cambridge, New York, just over that border that has started an agroforestry business. I forget exactly what it's called. Kevin Marr, M-A-H-E-R, is doing that. And what's interesting about that is that they're setting it up so that people can pool resources. So to have processing for different nut trees, it may be very costly. It may not be cost efficient for or cost effective for one person, one farmer to buy all this equipment. So there's equipment that all of the projects involved in this whole network, um, they, can, they can work together. So that's one. Um, I know that there's someone named Megan Giroux, who is, I'm not sure what she's doing now, but I know that she has been educating people about the possibility of, and the value of doing agroforestry here in, in New England. Um, and I know that colleagues of mine, friends of mine, um, some of you may know Studio Hill Farm in Shaftesbury, Vermont. Some of you may know of them because they're also, they're now a savory hub with the savory global network. And they're planning some agroforestry components to their whole project and a food forest where pigs will, um, will root among, among the trees. So that's, I know there are other ones and now I'm frustrated because I think Keith may have referred us to, um, to some, but Anyway, I, I, I know that they're out there and people are becoming more and more aware of the benefits of bringing trees, of, of integrating trees and crops, the alley cropping and trees and grazing. Thank you. We have another question here from Jean who asks, in your opinion, what is the best way to convince policymakers that these types of restorative projects are worth supporting? That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, not being someone who deals much in the realm of policy, but to answer that question, I can tell you what I'm doing. Um, so, I feel like, so for me, a crux is the media. How do we tell stories about what's possible and what's important? So I'm putting together a media initiative, working alongside, not in any official way, with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And our goal is to change the narrative. So rather than the way we have on all of our news, we have economic metrics. You know, you turn on the news, you'll know about the stock report, you know, if the stock market's up or down. You'll know, I mean, they bring in, you know, like durable goods are up, um, housing starts are down. And, you know, and what that does is that tells us that this is important. It's part of how we, see ourselves as a society. So what me, what I'm doing with my colleague at um, the Earth Institute, 
um, in, at, in, at Columbia University, Dale Willman, he um, co-runs the Resilience Media Project, is we are putting together a suite of ecological metrics and finding media partners to have in lieu of, you know, durable goods, you know, these figures and bonds are up or whatever, in, in lieu of that, maybe the soil health metric, the daily erosion report, um, you know, particulate matter. A anyway, a lot of a lot of these to because we know that ultimately that is the state of our earth determines the state of our well-being. So let's bring that into our consciousness in a in a daily way, into our daily me media diet. I don't know if that I don't think that answers your question, but um, policymakers, I think, share that with them. I know that um, there is soil health legislation being enacted throughout the country. And that is thanks to the hard work of many people who have worked to in help policymakers understand that soil health is not a fringe issue. Rather, it has everything to do with water quality, with um, the ability of agriculture practitioners to thrive, et cetera. So I think it's, you know, I guess policy, we, we need to think of policy as a participat participatory sport as well. So I invite you all to be part of that process. And we're lucky, you know, we're in small states. So I've, I've testified in the state, the Vermont State House, which is very accessible. And I imagine that the same is possible for all of you in New Hampshire. Thank you. Um, and I saw that Jean said thank you as well. And that um, changing the paradigm is what you, you recommend and that helped answer his question. Um, so we have another uh, comment and question from Ellen, who liked the eight second video. Thank you for showing that. <laughs> um, she's helping to restore soil in need of mass. She says our topsoil was removed for a 12 year period to make the back bay plus lots of lead. Any thoughts about convincing suburbanites of the value of soil? Wow. Um... What seems to be most effective is, well, one thing is having a, <clears throat> excuse me, having a pandemic when people are in their suburban homes and looking outside and saying, oh, maybe I can do something. Um, inviting people to grow their own food, encouraging people and showing people what's possible. Um, I really feel that gardening is a kind of gateway drug. Soil is a gateway drug to ecological optimism, to knowing what's possible because so much can change through improving soil and just getting people's hands in the soil helps them reconnect with the knowledge that we all have about how important the soil is and helps people pay attention, leads people to pay attention to what's happening ecologically and also invites people into conversations with other gardeners. So once you start gardening, you need to learn from other people who, who know more than you do. And then you're part of a community and all of this. I, I don't know, maybe if anyone has anything to add about how to help people see that soil matters. Um, I mean, having stories in the media, having films like Kiss the Ground and um, 
I, now I'm forgetting the soil, the, the, the um, biggest little farm. There are more films coming out all the time. There's a film that I was interviewed coming out called To Which We Belong, which is about soil. So the more it's out there, the more people will start to get it. Thank you. And we have some other comments here. So um, you were mentioning about savory hubs. We do have a savory hub in New Hampshire as well with Stonewall Farm in Keene. Um, and Julie also had a comment. She said um, for folks who might like to check out Oberlin College in Ohio, they have established environmental metrics and bring it to classrooms in the community. It could be a good collaboration or resource for folks. Um, scrolling down. Yeah, I'll just say the metrics thing is really interesting because there are metrics, it's measurements, it's possible to do in an inexpensive way that were not possible five years ago. I mean, just the capacity, the, the data that's out there and the capacity to draw on that data and bring that to a locality is, is just amazing. Definitely. And we have another question. This is from Trish. How can we encourage policy ma policymakers to move from subsidizing conventional and corporate farms to organic and sustainable farms, land restoration projects, etc.? Well, one thing is I think it is happening when I see when I see some of the kind of initiatives that are coming out of the new administration, it does seem to have a bit of a more holistic land health aspect. Um, the what's going to happen in the Department of Agriculture is a bit of a mystery at this point. Um, again, engage at a local level, engage at a state level, become part of these conversations. But yeah, policy policymakers need to be educated. That's one thing that really struck me when I testified in, Mon in Montpelier was how little the people that are making decisions actually know about some of these issues. So I went and spoke about um, neonicotinoids and, you know, in, in Vermont, it's a part-time legislature. They're not experts. They have the other jobs, but these people who are making decisions about whether the, these chemicals were allowed in our landscape had no idea, for example, that one coated seed can kill a songbird. It was totally news to them. So I, I, guess, I guess rather than convincing, because that, that kind of sets up a like push, you know, try, you can, it would invite us to think about um, educating policymakers. And also there, I see that someone's posting a, a group. Um, there's um, another group called the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, which is really active. And I think there are a number of people from New Hampshire on there too. And in that group, there are policy discussions. And I know that there was a workshop on how to bring a healthy soil initiative to your state and local government. So, so there are resources, there are people out there that can, that can help. Thank you. Yes, actually, um, Becky was mentioning that same group, um, Vermont Healthy Soil Coalition and Littleton Food Co-op are hosting 
a series called Soil Health and Community Resilience Stories from the North. Um, I know for New Hampshire has been helping to promote that series as well. Uh, so more information will be coming uh, to you all from that if you attend. And Chadley also did put uh, Judith's website into the chat. If people want to learn more about her books or reach out to her directly, that's a good place to start. Um, and I don't see any other questions right now. Is there any one last question before we go? <laughs> Well, I'll ask you a question. Earlier, when you were, uh, Judith, when you were talking about, um, uh, I think it was in Saudi Arabia, and you kept using a term, albeda, albedo. Oh, oh, albeda. Sorry about that. That's the name of the community. Ah, okay. Okay. So, so there's another, um, you're thinking of albedo, which is reflectivity which is yeah. a really, really important thing, you know, phenomenon that a factor in um, how ecosystems function. So for example, um, you know, we've got snow outside that has a high albedo, it's very reflective. You know, it reflects the light, it doesn't absorb the light. Whereas, um, you know, dark grass or bare soil absorbs it. But Thank yeah, you. so in, in the book, I, I talk about how um, in the rate that um, the Norwegian government demanded that reindeer herders cull their herds because the, there were too many reindeer and this was bad for the, e the tundra ecosystem, when in fact, it's the opposite that the, the behavior of the reindeer, the way they act upon the land actually maintains that ecosystem. And one reason is that it maintains the cooling because they, in the summer, they browse. And so they browse on the leaves. So the, the plants aren't as dark as, it, or the, the plants don't get as large, the shrubs don't get so large that there's a lot of dark green leaves that are absorbing the heat, rather the, the, the very light heather dominates. So, but that's a very important factor. Wonderful. Um, Chadley, may I just say one thing? I noticed because we had someone, at least one person from Massachusetts um, NOFA, New Hampshire uh, is one of seven state chapters of the Northeast Organic Farming Association and all of the chapters across the various states do help work with policy. So if you're interested in policy efforts in a state outside of New Hampshire in the New England Northeast region, you can go to um, your you know, NOFA chapter in that state and see what they're up to as well to engage. Um, thank, thank you for bringing that up. Locally. Yeah, and, and, and in Vermont, there's also rural Vermont. And mm -hmm. so I don't know if you have something parallel. Thank you. Chadley, I'll let you take, take over. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Judith, so much for your time and your wisdom and experience that you shared with us all. And thank you, everyone, for spending the whole day with us and spending this session with us. Um, just to remind everyone, you can find Judith's books um, at our conference bookstore through Main Street Bookends. And also, yes, uh, you can go check out her website as well. Um, and I'm just going to thank you all again that uh, today was wonderful. Tomorrow starts at 8.45 again, and the first speaker tomorrow is J.M. Fortier. Um, he'll be speaking about living soils and uh, more of a technical farming workshop uh, in the context of the market garden. And um, I want to also let you guys know that this recording will be available. It won't be available immediately, but within the week or so, we'll make sure to email all the recordings from all the sessions to you guys. And I just uh, see in the chat box, there's a lot of thanks and appreciation for you, Judith. I'm sure you can see that too. 
And um, yeah, let's see. So I'm just gonna put up my final slide as we all say goodbye for the evening. Thanks to you all. And thanks for your patience. Okay. All right, let's see. All right, guys, so let's see. Oh, I gotta make sure we play this here. Okay, thank you. I think that's gonna do it for us. And once again, just thanks everyone. I hope to see you tomorrow, get some rest and we'll be back with you for another awesome day of the NOFA New Hampshire Winter Conference in our 50th year. All right. Take care, everybody. Good night. We'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs>